اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم I'd like to welcome you to a new episode of Beacon of Truth I'd like to welcome my studio audience, my panel and most of all my dear viewers at home Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu Today with us we have uh, Ghasid Moin Saab, Ayaz Mahmood Khan Saab and Abdul Qudus Saab In the previous program we talked about the varying differences between the Ahmadiyya Jamaat and the rest of the Muslim Ummah we talked about how Hazrat Masimo Salam, Hazrat Mizar Ghulam Ahmed Qadiani Salam, came to the Muslim Ummah and to the world to create unity and brotherhood amongst the whole world. He came to unify people under one banner to make sure that everyone believed and practiced the same thing. In today's program, what we intend to do is to talk about those apparent differences in doctrines and those apparent differences in practices which can be seen and which are contradicted against, which have allegations against by opponents of the Jamaat when looking at the practices of the Jamaat Ahmadiyya and the rest of Muslim Ummah. <coughs> Abdul Qadus Sab, are these practices and doctrines truly different? Or do we have different concepts of the certain things? Or is it merely a different view on these things? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Mansur, this is a very relevant question, especially nowadays, as most Muslims believe that the Ahmadiyya community is apart from them and they have their own ideologies, doctrines and beliefs. However, this is not the case. This, there's more similarities between the Ahmadiyya community and our other non-Muslim brothers and sisters. Like them, our Muslim creed is the same, La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah, that there is none worthy of worship except Allah and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the messenger. Similarly, we believe that the Holy Prophet, Hazrat Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is Khatum al nabiyin and that the Holy Qur'an is the last revealed book from God Almighty and it's the last Sharia, it's the last law from God Almighty which was revealed unto the Holy Prophet Like other Muslim sects, the Ahmadi community also has uh, five uh, pillars of Islam which they believe in. Like I've mentioned before, Kalima Tayyibah, Namaz, Roza, Zakat, Hajj. All these are the foundations and fundamental things in Islam which the Ahmadi community also believes in. So there's no difference there also. Another point is that the Articles of Faith, we believe in Allah, we believe in His uh, angels, we believe in the Prophets, we believe in, in His books, we believe in the Last Day of Judgment, we believe in the Divine Decree, exactly the same beliefs as other Muslims. So there is no difference at all in our ideologies, in our conduct, in our beliefs, it's exactly the same. I mean, I guess we're understanding the fact that, okay, right, we say okay, the five pillars of Islam are the same. We say that the six articles of faith are the same. We're saying that these fundamentals are the same. Then the question obviously arises is that why is there a need? Why is there a need for a new Jamaat, a new Jamaat with a new name? If we believe in the same thing, then what's the need in establishing another community with a separate name and a separate, um, a separate entity, in it were? This is the next question which arises that why do we need a, a new community to be born out of, uh, out of Islam? So the answer is straightforward that the Holy Quran and the Holy Prophet Hazrat Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wasallam have prophesied the coming of a Messiah, the coming of a Imam Mahdi in the latter days. The Quran says, وَآخَرِينَ مِنْهُمْ لَمَّا يَلْحَقُوا بِهِمْ This is in Surah Jummah. And uh, similarly, there are many prophecies of the Holy Quran which relate to the coming of a Messiah in the latter days and we believe that that Messiah has come already in the remote village of Gardian, in, uh, in the remote village in India and Gardian. We believe that the person whose uh, the signs that the Holy Prophet Sallallahu had mentioned was fulfilled in the person of Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed wasalam, of Gardian. So, whereas all the other Muslim sects are still awaiting that Messiah, but the only difference is the identity. We've identified that Messiah to be Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed wasalam, whereas all the other Muslims are still waiting for that Messiah. So this is the fundamental difference and only difference between us and other Muslim sects. Okay, brilliant. So we've established the fact that in reality, back at the fundamentals and the principles, we are completely and exactly the same. Well, a question then obviously that naturally arises is that there are certain things that we see as a difference in the practice. One such which is often talked about in both in the Ahmadiyya community and outside the Ahmadiyya community is the Ahmadiyya oath of initiation, i.e. the bet. Now, it may seem that when we believe 
we already believe, as long with all the other Muslims in the world, that the Holy Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is the Khatim al Nabiyin. He is the greatest Prophet. We believe that he brought the perfect book, the perfect message, the perfect teaching. And we all claim to be the followers of that perfect message and that perfect teaching. We all uphold the respect and the rank of the Holy Prophet Muhammad Then surely there is no need for another oath of initiation to be done at someone else's hand. If we believe and we uphold that rank of the utmost, the best, the perfect Prophet, then what is the need of abiding by the rules or entering into an oath of initiation with anyone else? Uh, Qasasab, could you please? Um, <clears throat> I think this is a very valid question, especially from our um, non ahmadi viewers, that um, why do we have to do bed at the hands of the Promised Messiah, alayhi salatu wa salam? Why, did, why was there a bed? Well, um, I think there is a very basic uh, answer to this. And in fact, the Holy Prophet of Islam, Hazrat Khatamul Anbiya, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he gave this answer himself. And it's such a basic answer that at this um, answer, I think all questions close, all avenues close. The Holy Prophet وسلم, says in uh, Ibn Majah that, أَيْتُمُوهُ, that when you see him, فَبَايِعُوهُ, then do bet at his hands. Now, just these two words, they, they show that the um, bet at the hand of the Promised Messiah وسلم, is a simple command of um, the Holy Prophet. But the Holy Prophet وسلم, doesn't say this, doesn't just finish at this. He says that, um, that even if you have to climb mountains of ice, then you should go and do the bayt at the hand of the Promised Messiah وسلم, because فَإِنَّهُ خَلِيفَةُ اللَّهِ الْمَهْدِي Because he is the Khalifa of Allah and he is the Mahdi. This is such a simple answer, but he has emphasized it so much so that he said, even if you have to climb mountains, not mountains, but mountains of ice, so he's, he's, he's drawn attention to this important matter that you have to do bed at the, that person's hand when he arrives. Now, not only this, um, in another hadith, we find that the Holy Prophet وسلم, says, it's a very long um, uh, chunk of uh, hadith, but I think I'll just pick out the small bit, the very important bit, fundamental bit. When the Holy Prophet وسلم, says that when the Messiah comes, he will go to the, uh, he will reach, he will go to the sky, he will go to um, a star called the Pleiades, the Surayya Satara, and he will bring faith back down. Now, what does that mean? Faith isn't a physical thing. Faith, faith isn't something that he will bring back down and lock up somewhere or he will keep somewhere as a physical object. Faith is something we have in our hearts. So when we say that he will bring faith back down to the ground, it means he will instill it into the hearts of all the believers at that time. And at that time, there will be a group of believers who will believe in him and he will instill that faith, that Iman, into the hearts of those believers. And we see in 1889 that uh, the Promised Messiah did this, did exactly this. He had a, com uh, he had a, um, a group of um, 40 people uh, for his community who were ready uh, to do bayt according to the um, command of the Holy Prophet وسلم, at the hand of, of the Promised Messiah. Mm. And they did exactly this. And that bayt was called by the Promised Messiah himself, Bayt Toba Barai Husule Takwa Taharat. That is the bayt for repentance, for, a, for the acquisition of righteousness and purification. Now, this, if our non Ahmadi brethren say that we've done something which is different, un Islamic, well, then this name itself, it says that we've done something which is completely Islamic, which the Holy, which the Holy Prophet وسلم, wanted to happen. He wanted his believers to have righteousness um, uh, in their hearts. He wanted them to be cleansed. He wanted them to be those who repent. So if there is a difference between us, if, if they say that this is the difference, then yes, we do have a difference. This is the fundamental difference, that we try to be righteous, as the Holy Prophet وسلم, said. So yes, if... Um, the, the, the importance of uh, doing bayt has been said by the Holy Prophet وسلم, himself. And um, I think um, if, if I just show you the, the form for doing bayt, I think it, it's a very um, uh, good moment to show that this, this is the form which um, uh, a person writes, uh, fills when he enters the Jamaat. And you will find nothing un-Islamic in this whatsoever. Um, you see this that the person says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika la. That's the fundamental uh, belief of a Muslim. Everything here is Islamic. And when I turn over, uh, in here is just uh, the details which one should f uh, fill in. 
over here are the conditions of birth which the promised Messiah uh, wrote down himself. And just the first, I'll, I'll read out a few. The first uh, says that the initiate shall solemnly promise that he shall abstain from shirk, association of any partners with God right up to the day of his death. That's la ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah in, in itself. That's exactly what the promised Messiah wasalam, taught. Another t uh, condition of this is that he shall refrain from following un-Islamic customs. That's just, I think that's exactly the answer to your question, that there's nothing different in this. In fact, the promised Messiah wasalam, who came uh, by the command of the Holy Prophet wasalam, he taught uh, nothing un-Islamic and what he taught was completely Islamic and according to the teachings and the command of the Holy Prophet Okay, brilliant. So we've understood completely, I hope, that the, the oath of initiation that the Jamaat e Ahmadiyya actually holds is in fact in complete accordance with the teachings of Islam. The things that are mentioned in the, in the oath of initiation, as Ghassad Muin Sab rightly just said, are in complete accordance, in complete unity with the teachings that the Holy Prophet Muhammad Wasallam has given us and in fact are absolutely in no way contradictory to them. All there is, is that in jamaat e Ahmadiyya, there is a reiterance. It is a, it, it's saying to do these things again, it's, it's a reminder that those teachings that our beloved Holy Prophet Khatam al Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said for us to do, it is merely a reminder for us to do them again. And this bayt is merely a promise. This oath of initiation is a promise to God and a promise to yourself that what you have told us to do, O oh Allah, we will endeavor to do it. So for someone to say that this is against Islam, or this is a non-Islamic practice, is completely wrong. For if anyone is to actually pick up a bad form and to read what's written inside this form, no one can say that the things included in this form are against Islamic practice or teaching. We understand that when a promised Messiah or a promised reformer comes along, when he is sent by God, we understand that the reason why he is sent, there must be some sort of wisdom. There's some sort of knowledge is unknown to us behind his advent. A reason behind which God has foreseen and has sent this reformer to come and reform. But in order for a reformer to come, there must be something to reform. There must be something wrong which is going on for the mechanic to come and fix it. Because after all, we say in English, if it's, if it's not broke, don't fix it. So there was obviously something wrong in the people. There was obviously something wrong which was going on in the world which needed and required a promised reformer to be sent. So Ayaz Mahmoud Khan Sahib, could you shed any light on this? What were those things that were going wrong? What was going wrong in the nation that a promised reformer had to be sent? Well, Mansoor, if we look at the history of religion and we see the purpose of any prophet, we will see that they are sent for one primary purpose and that is to establish unity in a society which has forgotten about their true one God. So what happened in this era as well was that although apparently Muslims believed in a single God, in one God, certain beliefs had crept into the Islamic teachings, into the practices of the Muslims, which were completely negating that very unity of God the Almighty. And the promised Messiah salam, as per the prophecy of the Holy Prophet Muhammad wasallam, came to rejuvenate and reinstate that unity of God into the hearts of people. And this is not a mere claim. We see that practically this was happening because the concept of the physical ascension of Jesus السلام, and his physical descent and then the attribution of godly attributes to that prophet of God who was a humble servant of Allah was a perfect example of how the unity of Allah was being forgotten. Because on one hand we had Muslims who were claiming that Prophet Jesus Islam, had the ability of being a khaliq, a creator, and he created uh, birds of clay and breathed into them, and then they began to fly. And as if you could not tell the difference between those birds which were created by Jesus and those birds which were created by Allah. This is shirk in essence. So the promised Messiah Islam, came in this era to tell people that we should understand that unity needs to be established again. Then. Mansur, when people started to believe that Jesus, see, when you lose unity, then you open up a whole Pandora's box. And then everything else, every other degenerative element of the religion is an offshoot of that. 
And that's what we saw in the Muslim Ummah at that time. When they attributed the physical ascension of Jesus Islam, to him and then godly attributes, they had to accept that the Holy Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is also physically alive and has ascended into the heavens. And then they had to believe that the Mi'raj or the spiritual ascension of the Holy Prophet Muhammad وسلم, which was a wonderful, sublime, spiritual experience of the highest degree, that was also physical as well. And then after that they began to attribute all, then there was the concept of the abrogation of verses of the Holy Quran. Then there was a belief which that um, the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was as if present even in the physical world and there are certain groups of Muslims who would even stand up and say that since we are doing salutations upon the Holy Prophet he is physically present now in this majlis or in this assembly. So the promised Messiah Alaihi came to correct all of these things and this was his primary purpose and we see that he, done, he did this in a very beautiful manner. So again, we're basically understanding, slowly, slowly we're coming, as we're elaborating on each of these points, we're truly understanding that in reality, if anyone was to look at it with a slight piece of conscience, they'd see that there's actually no difference whatsoever between the doctrines of the Ahmadiyya Jamaat and the doctrines of the mainstream Muslims. Absolutely none. And any difference in practice is merely on because, the, any difference in practice is merely because of the fact that as an Ahmadi, you have sworn to endeavor to continue to do those things which you have vowed to do as a Muslim. Being a Muslim, you are expected to do certain things. And purely by being an Ahmadi, you are continuously reviving yourself. You are reviving that faith within yourself. And the purpose of Hazrat Masih to come, to create unity. Now unity wasn't to create unity onto something which was already wrong, already something which was, which was almost perverted as it were. In fact, it was something to create unity on something which was clean and pure. And to do that first, something needs to be done, something needs to be clean. So when Hazrat Masih Islam came, he took out this element of shirk. He took out this element of attributing godly attributes to things that God created. When they say that Jesus took birds of clay and breathed into them a spirit and let the birds fly, he took out these concepts. He's made the concepts clear that the one thing that you need is the unity of God. Without the unity of God, then all else, is, is all else ma matters not. If you don't have the unity, you have absolutely nothing. But when you have the unity from that, you can build the foundations of a perfect religion. Okay, so can we come to the audience, please? Like, I can see we have quite a few questions. So, yes, please, in the corner. Aslam um, Ayaz Khan Sahib mentioned that um, at the time of the Promised Messiah's advent, um, there were many negatives in the Muslim Ummah. Uh, one of the things that Yasab mentioned was um, about the ascension of Hazrat Isa. The question I have is did uh, Promised Messiah himself not at one stage believe that Hazrat Isa was also alive in heaven? Okay, well, brilliant. This is a question which is often asked and which is often beautifully replied to and I'm sure that Ayaz and Khan Sab will shed light on this matter. The question is that at a certain point in time, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed Qadiani wasalam, himself believed that Jesus was alive in heaven and had physically ascended. And now, standing here, we as the Ahmadiyya community say that no, in fact, he did not raise physically to the heavens. So there seems to be an apparent contradiction here. So, Yasmin Khansab, could you please shed some light on the matter? Absolutely. It is true that at one time the Promised Messiah, alayhi salatu wasalam, along with the other Muslims, believed that Jesus, alayhi salam, physically ascended into the heavens and that he would physically descend. But if we analyze this, this is something which shows the innocence of the Promised Messiah, alayhi salatu wasalam. Because as the other Muslims believed, he too believed the same thing and he had great reverence for the pro for Prophet Jesus, alayhi salam. But one thing which we must understand is that the knower of the unseen is only Allah. That's why the Holy Quran says that Alimul Ghaibi, that He is the knower of the unseen, Allah. Fala yudhiru ala ghaibihi illa man min rasul. That He reveals His knowledge of the unseen upon His messengers, upon those people who He appoints. Now, yes, the Promised Messiah believed this, but when He was appointed as that Jesus who was to come in the latter days, then the promised Messiah states 
that Allah told me through his revelation that Jesus Islam, had in fact passed away a natural death. And then he taught me to find those verses in the Holy Quran which prove the death of Jesus. And he, that is Allah, told me the ahadith which also showed that Jesus Islam, had passed away a natural death and that you, O Mirza Ghulam Ahmed Islam, have come as the second manifestation of that Jesus Islam. If the promised Messiah Islam, God forbid, was a false man who came with a hidden agenda and he knew that he was going to claim to be the second manifestation of Jesus Islam, then he would have never ascribed to this belief. But the fact that he believed this initially and then Allah told him otherwise and then he also promoted that concept is proof of the fact that prophets only state that which Allah the Almighty teaches them. And so too is the case with the Promised Messiah Islam. So again, we see that this, even though apparently seems to be an allegation on the Promised Messiah Islam, in truth, it actually provides an absolutely amazing and beautiful example of just how innocent and pure both the character of Hazrat Masimud, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed Qadiani was, not only did it prove how pure his character was, but it also, it also proved how pure his claim was. That at one point, when he did not have the knowledge and the wisdom given to him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said one thing, he said that yes, Jesus was alive in heaven. But as soon as Allah ta'ala gave him that knowledge, he then openly said, well, I didn't know it before. But now that Allah Ta'ala has given me that light in my mind, has given me that knowledge, I now openly say that no, I do not believe in this. And in fact, I now believe that he did not physically go to heaven. And that in fact, he died here on earth. So this, in every sense of the way, proves the truthfulness and the purity and the innocence of Hazrat Masim al-Islam's claim. And in no way can be this be said against him. Yes, please. Yes. Assalamu alaikum. My question is that in the Quran and Kareem, in Surah Jumma, Allah Ta'ala has given the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And besides that, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has given the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to the Imam Adil Islam and Isa Alaihi Wasallam. So, this is the fact that 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 this is the fact تو اس معنی میں جب سیدنا حضرت مسیح مہود اللہ السلام نے امام مہدی ہونے کا اور مسیح مہود ہونے کا دعویٰ کیا ہے اور امتی نبی ہونے کا تو جو لوگ ان پر ایمان نہیں لاتے خاص طور پر اسلامی دنیا میں سے ان کا کیا سٹیٹس ہے ہمارے نزدیک کیا وہ مسلمان ہیں اور اگر انکار کے باوجود وہ مسلمان ہیں تو کیا اس سے حضرت مسیح مہود اللہ السلام پر ایمان لانے کا جو اہمیت ہے اس پر کوئی فرق پڑتا ہے اکی بریان for the benefit of the viewers, I'll just uh, I'll translate the question into English. The question is that when in Surah Jummah we have a reference and a prophecy of the coming of the Promised Messiah والسلام, in a spiritual or a zili, i.e. a shadow form, and when we have the numerous ahadith that point towards the same fact, then in na today's, today's nowadays age, when we see that some people are rejecting that same claim of the Promised Messiah والسلام, and some people are then what is our stance on that when we see ourselves as Jamaat Ahmadiyya as having accepted the claim of the Promised Messiah Hazrat Mizah Ghulam Ahmad Qadiani والسلام, and we see that others have not accepted that same claim then do we call them Muslims because nowadays in today's society there is a lot of hustle and bustle as it were regarding the whole um, the kufr ka fatwa, i.e. calling somebody a kafir, saying you are not a believer and I am a believer. So in the same way, by somebody not accepting and rejecting the claim of the promised Messiah, do we then call him a kafir? Do we call him a non-believer? Or do we allow him, uh, do we allow that person then to continue being in the fold of Islam? And if so, if we do say, okay, fine, you are a Muslim, regardless of whether you believe in the promised Messiah والسلام, or not, does that not surely bring down the level of importance of the claim of the Prophet ﷺ? Does that not bring down his importance at all by saying, you can be a Muslim, you don't need to believe in the Prophet ﷺ? Ayyasab, could you shed some light on the matter, please? Yes. As far as the concept of who is a Muslim and who is not a Muslim, we as Muslims do not have the right to put a verdict on somebody. Because our Holy Master, the Prophet Muhammad has clearly mentioned 
that anybody who says La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, that there is no God except Allah and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is the messenger of Allah, then he is a Muslim. At one occasion, a census was taking place in Medina and the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not even put that condition. He said, Uktubu li man talafada bil Islam. That write for me anybody who says I'm Muslim. That's it. Nothing after that was mentioned. So anybody who claims I'm a Muslim, we as Ahmadis accept him to be a Muslim. Now as far as this concept of kufr or disbelief is concerned, there's different levels of this disbelief. The Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa has even mentioned that man taraka salata muta'amidan faqad kafar. That anybody who has left his daily prayers intentionally, he has done kufr. This does not mean that he is outside the pale of Islam, not at all. This means that he is a Muslim, but he has rejected that specific injunction of God the Almighty. So too is the case with those brothers of ours who are Muslims, but they have not yet recognized the promised Messiah We say this not out of hatred that so and so is a, kufr, is a kafir. This is not our jurisdiction to do so. We have extreme love and great sympathy for our brethren. We consider ourselves fortunate that we have been granted that guidance of Allah the Almighty to recognize the Imam. And we hope and pray from the depths of our heart that Allah enables our other brothers to also recognize the promised Messiah Until they do that, that does not mean they're non-Muslims. It just means they have not understood that the promised Messiah is a truthful man yet. And inshallah, hopefully they will. But we must understand that there's different, different levels of this kufr. Just because a person is a kafir of one thing doesn't mean that that throws him outside the pale of Islam. And then another thing, let's, let's ask non-Ahmadi Muslims, our brothers and sisters, that when the Messiah, salam, hypothetically, the physical Jesus salam, of 2,000 years ago descends in the latter days, those people who do not believe in him, what will be your stance about them? Of course, they will be a kafir or a disbeliever of that promised Messiah salam. But that does not mean that we have the right to go around issuing verdicts that you're not a Muslim, you're a kafir. This term kafir needs to be understood. Could you have anything to add? Yeah, I'll, uh, with regards to one of uh, a narration that we see um, is that Hazrat Osama, he, was a com he was came back from a, um, a war and he said to the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that um, today I've, I've killed such and such person um, as I knew that he, he, he's, he claimed to be a Muslim. He said, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. But I knew that deep inside he had truly not accepted. However, the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what he said, what his response was, that he said that, did you actually open his heart and check? And uh, are you, did you have that knowledge of whether he was telling a lie or was he was he truthful, yeah. and uh, as Osama was like he he said he says that I wish I wasn't a Muslim before this this incident took place. So yeah. So you can actually feel, even sitting here, so many hundreds of years later, you can feel the passion, and the anger, from the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, when somebody was to non rightfully declare that so and so is not actually a believer. They may claim to be a believer, but. Well, they're not. I, I don't believe them to be a believer. And if we, as Muslims, be it Ahmadi, be it non Ahmadi, if we claim to be Muslims, we claim that our perfect example, our perfect person to follow is the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he had such passion regarding saying someone has Iman or not, saying it was whether someone is a believer or not. Then for us to walk around in day-to-day -day basis and over small things say, no, you're a kafir, no, you don't have belief, no, well, you're not a Muslim, you've fallen out of the pale of Islam. For us to go around saying these sorts of things is completely opposite and derogatory to the message of Islam. It completely goes against the example of our perfect Prophet, Khatna Munreen, Hazrat Muhammad Mustafa Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Following the last few episodes, we've received numerous emails some of which saying thanks, some of which expressing their gratitude, some of which giving their comments, and some obviously expressing their questions. Now, I'd just like to go through a, a few of these emails which have been given to us, um, just, to, just to show that we are thankful and we're, gr we're grateful for your input from you at home. A question which was raised um, on a previous episode was one regarding the term used summa sakata. Now, this was a term which we portrayed in a certain way and which 
has a caused a, a, a question to arise from our viewer Zubair Sab um, on, uh, via email. So uh, Kudu Sab, um, Suma Sakata was a term which was used in a previous episode. Could you please clarify? The, uh, the viewer um, stated the fact that Suma Sakata merely means that he remained quiet. And our view on the fact that it, uh, it denotes a continuation isn't true. So could, could you please shed some light on the matter? I'm referring to the famous hadith uh, which is in Muslim Ahmed bin Hanbal um, with regards to Khilafat in uh, the Muslim Ummah. Uh, the hadith, uh, briefly, it's a long hadith, I'll quickly briefly describe what it says. That it starts off that after the prophethood of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there will be Khilafat ala min hajin nubuwa, that there will be Khilafat on the precepts of prophethood. Then following that, after that period, there will be caliphs who will be tyrants. Following that period of after tyranny, there will be such a monarchy that will be, um, that again, it will have a role as a tyrant. There will be tyrants in that monarchy as well. And then at the end, there will be Khilafat ala min hajin nubuwa again, which again means the Khilafat on the precepts of Prophet. Therefore, Prophet is required to come so this Khilafat can start. Then right at the end, has the hadith, the narration says, Thumma Sakata, that the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam remained silent. What does it mean? That's the question, right? That how can we, we refer as Muslims, as uh, Ahmadiyya Muslims, we refer this to mean that Khilafat will inshallah last for the day of judgment. How do we, um, how, how do we come to this belief? That's the question. It's simple that the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has given so much detail with regards to caliphate, he said that there will be Khilafat Allah min Hajj and first, then th there will be monarchies, where there will be, be tyrants, etc., etc., and then there will be Khilafat Allah min Hajj and again. So if there was meant to be something meant to come afterwards, clearly the Holy Prophet وسلم, would mention it. Another point to remember is that Hazrat Abu Huzaifa, who's related this hadith, he says, uh, he actually mentioning this narration as Thumma Sakata. He also knew, as a Sahabi of the Holy Prophet وسلم, that there's so much wisdom in the Holy Prophet وسلم, remaining silent as well. Therefore, there's a hidden prophecy in this. That's why he narrated it, saying Thumma Sakata, that the Holy Prophet وسلم, remained silent. Meaning that, Alhamdulillah, by the grace of Allah, and inshallah, that this Khilafat Allah min Hajj al which is a continuation of the first Khilafat Allah min Hajj al will last to the Day of Judgment. This is where we uh, gain our belief from that this Khilafat will last for the Day of Judgment. Okay, brilliant. Um, so we've understood therefore that Summa Sakata in this sense actually does mean a continuation because if we're to say that well him remaining, uh, him being the Holy Prophet Muhammad وسلم, remaining silent merely meant that he didn't say anything afterwards we're making the Holy Prophet Muhammad وسلم, seem like a normal man, a normal man who didn't have anything to say so he remained quiet was any Muslim or any common sense owning Muslim would surely say that anything that came out or didn't come out of the Holy Prophet Muhammad's blessed mouth should have some, not should have, does have and did have a blessed wisdom behind it. And therefore by the Holy Prophet Muhammad وسلم, remaining quiet, it had a grand and hidden prophecy for anyone who wishes and who has the eyes to see. Okay, we have again, we have many, many questions. Um, yes, yes, please. Um, with your permission, um, the p I have a point, now a question, which will take us back to the question asked by my brother about the truthfulness of the Prophet Messiah, who believed that um, Hazrat Isa um, um, physically was ascended to the heavens, and then later he changed his belief when God had already um, told him that this was not what happened, and then he taught him, I mean, he showed him the light of the Holy Quran, teaching him himself what it actually meant. Um, this is a point raised mostly by Muslims, so um, I'll reference, I'll, I mean, I'll take them back to the Holy Prophet Sallallahu that this has actually happened to him as well in his, in his lifetime. Um, there was once that a Jew had a, an, a, an argument with a Muslim about um, whether Hazrat Musa salam, was a greater prophet or Hazrat Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was a greater prophet. So they came to the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and um, they presented this matter to him. And the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam turned to the Muslim and said, La tufaddiluni ala Musa, don't hold me superior to Hazrat Musa salam. And then later, when God revealed to him that, in, in, in fact, you are Khatam on the beginning, you are the I mean, best of my creation, was given to him, and then best of all prophets. So there was once that um, someone called him, um, Ya Khairal Bariya, 
I mean, you I mean called him the best of creation as well. And then he said to that person, Haka um, Ibrahim alayhi salam, this status belongs to Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam. So at that time he thought that I am not even the best of prophets. I mean, I'm not even the best of creation. But then later God revealed to him that actually you are this person. So like you said, this proves the, I mean, the truthfulness of the Hazrat Masih Muhammad alayhi salam. In the same case, the best example we can give is the example of um, the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam that this even happened to him. Okay, well, do we have any other questions from the audience? Uh, yes, sir, please. Um, we see from the Quranic verses and the supporting hadiths that um, Hazrat Isa al Islam has died a natural death. Um, but is there any evidence from the Holy Bible that we can prove that um, Hazrat Isa al Islam has actually died a natural death? Okay. Well, again, a lot of the time when we try, t when we do um, prove the fact that Hazrat Isa, Jesus, died a natural death. We also we claim from the uh, from the Quran itself. We claim that this verse states this, and therefore it results in Jesus's natural death. The question that's arise now is that okay, yes, we do claim from the Quran and we prove it satisfactory from the Quran, but can we actually claim that Jesus died a natural death from the Holy Bible? Um, Gasser, sir, please. Um, for this uh, question, I think. It would be appropriate to have a Bible in front of me, and I could uh, give you a few references. I wish I did have a Bible right now, but um, I think one uh, <coughs> sorry, I think one uh, answer which should suffice, and it's it's using common sense that look, Prophet Jesus was praying the night before. It says that he prayed all night and cried to God Almighty, and he said that you know please pray, uh, protect me from this from this. Um, danger which is about to um, overtake me and which which I will be entering into and he he t uh, kept on emphasizing the point to his companions and said you know don't go to sleep please pray because this is a very tough time for our community right now and he prayed all night and how is it possible I mean if we ask our Christian brothers how is it possible that uh, uh, prophet Jesus والسلام, whom we consider a prophet and uh, give great uh, 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 respect to how is it possible that a prophet like him who prayed to God Almighty didn't have his prayers answered I mean I think that's one uh, answer I, I can give without the Bible in front of me it's it's just you know impossible to understand that God didn't listen to his prayers even on the cross we hear that he said Eli Eli Lima Sabakhtani that God oh God why have you forsaken me when such a cry is said, my, uh, my belief is that God doesn't uh, forsake his, uh, especially prophet, not just a person, human being, but a prophet. He doesn't forsake his um, prophet just like that. He does protect him at that time of hardship. I mean, we see that Jesus, in fact, was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane so hard, in fact, that it said that he cried tears of blood. This is the extent at which Hazrat Isa, alayhi salatu wasalam, may peace and blessings be upon him, was praying to God was supplicating so hard that his tears had turned to blood. And he cried to God that, Oh God, take this cup of suffering away from me for it's too much for me to bear. So how is it possible for anyone who has even the smallest amount of respect for Jesus, alayhi salatu wasalam, forget seeing him as a prophet, just as a normal person of God, who taught his whole life, if you pray to God, God will answer your prayer. For him to supplicate so heavily that his tears turn to blood and yet God to still turn away from him and reject his prayer and leave him to suffer. It's impossible to think that. So I think, does that answer your question? Yes, so you had a question. My question is uh, regarding prayers. Yeah, so uh, prayers are offering after a non, uh, non amdi uh, Imam. So what is the reason behind we, we should not offer our prayers behind non, non amdi Muslim? So the question is, which is also a very commonly um, raised question, is that why is it, as is, as is general knowledge in the Jamaat, that we do not actually do namaz or offer the prayers behind a non Ahmadi Imam? So why is this? Why do we not do why do we not do the prayers behind them? Surely they are a Muslim as well. Um, um, Abdul Qudus Sahib, could you please shed some light on the matter? Jazakallah. Uh, before coming to this question, just a point about the Bible. Um, we see that uh, Jesus Alayhi Salatu his companions made Marhami Isa. They made an ointment for him. Now, one should ask themselves that, would you put an ointment to cure someone who's already passed away? I mean, this ointment was not easy to make either. Twelve, 12 herbs were required for this ointment, and they're very hard to get. 
And so th the question arises that would you spend so much effort and time and, uh, and an ointment which is meant to cure the, uh, the wounds, would you spend so much effort and time for a dead man? Of course, it's this, not. This was an ointment that is till now of known course. and recorded in apothecary diaries Absolutely. regarding when soldiers would come back with heavy wounds, this, this uh, marhami isa would be applied to that to finish the wound, to stop the wound, to stop the bleeding, to heal it. So exactly, definitely, why would the, why would the companions of Hazrat Isa use this ointment upon Hazrat Isa knowing full well that he died? It obviously points towards the fact that Hazrat Isa was alive and well and that this this medicine was used to in fact cure him. So in, uh, coming, back to the, coming back to the question, Guru Sahib, could you... Back to the question is that, first of all, you should remember that it's not because we have any enmity or any dislike towards our other Muslim brothers and sisters. It's not that at all. We should remember the fundamental point is that a, a person who has been commissioned by God Almighty and is commissioned by the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as an Imam, as, a, as a Sahih uh, Bukhari and Muslim both quote this hadith saying, Imamukum minkum that the Messiah will be an Imam from amongst the Muslim Ummah. Now, he's been given this title of Imam. So one person, an Imam of uh, our non ahmadi Muslim brothers, who rejects the promised Messiah, who has been referred to as an Imam by God Almighty and the Holy Prophet Wasallam. then how can we pray behind that person? His belief is incomplete with, with reject, by rejecting the promised Messiah, because as what Qasid Saab mentioned before, that the Prophet, Holy Prophet says that when you see him then do be, uh, allege yourself with him and do allegiance at his hand oath, do an oath with him that you should help his um, jamaat and his, um, his community so that's the first point the second point to remember is that when we do um, we see that all other Muslim sects they have fatwas of kafir against each other they, they, say, they said that, oh, a Shia will say to a Sunni that you're a, you're a disbeliever and vice versa. So if we were to go into a Sunni mosque and pray behind a Sunni Imam, then the Shia will say, you've prayed behind a disbeliever. So this is a no-win situation for us at the moment. Another point to remember is that when we enter a mosque of our non-Ahmadi brothers and sisters, they say, oh, you've made it unclean, unpure, you've polluted it. Again, we have no, we have no choice. So, what, first of all, it's a contradictory question. Why do they want us to pray behind them when they say so much against us? And if we don't pray behind them, they'll be asking, why do you, why do you not pray behind us? So, I think that will suffice. Exactly. I mean, in the time, back in the time when Ahmadiyyat was in its preliminary stages, when an Ahmadi would come into a mosque and do namaz in a, a Ghair Ahmadi mosque, they would come and they would rip out the ground, they'd wash it, they'd do everything to it to say this ground has become unclean because a disbeliever has prayed on there. In the Fatave or the, uh, the decisions by Hazrat Masimah he has said that it is it's not even us that has started it, it is you that have started it. When he was asked regarding why we do not do namaz, why we do not supplicate and why do we not pray behind a, a non ahmadi Imam, Hazrat Masimah Masim clearly said the completely sensical answer that it was you who started it you said do not pray with us you would rip out the ground when we did when we prayed on that ground and yet now you are the ones who are turning to us saying why do you not pray behind us so the first question which shouldn't be addressed to the Ahmadis it should be addressed to the people who in fact didn't want us to do uh, prayers behind them in the first place the, the allegation isn't in fact on the Ahmadiyya Jamaat, it is on those people that stopped us praying there in the first place. Yeah. Yes, yes, Qasim. I just to add a point on is that um, we, we might have any, uh, some non-Muslim viewers watching at home and they might think that well, n no non-Muslim is allowed in our mosque because we were talking about ripping things out of the ground. So obviously, I think I'd like to clear for them that that's not our stance. It might be the stance of other Muslims, but our stance is that any non-Muslim is allowed in our mosque and is allowed to pray there as uh, other people allow us to um, uh, pray in their mosque. It's an uh, you know, intermixing society. We don't believe in completely cutting ourselves away from other societies. Very briefly, do you have anything yeah, to This is proven by the ahadith of the Holy Prophet Muhammad wasallam. when a Christian delegation came from Najran, the Holy Prophet wasallam said that you can pray here. And they were facing the other direction of the Kaaba and they said we should go out and pray. The Holy Prophet said no, you can pray here. This is also a house of God, a house of worship. So we welcome people into our mosques without any doubt. Uh, yes, um, audience. Um, yes, please. To add a point regarding the previous question uh, on the purity of his claim, 
in Izala Ham, Hazrat Masimud writes that uh, I, Allah Ta'ala revealed to me that I am Adam, Hazrat Adam, and no one said anything. No one like made any allegiance, like alleg uh, allegation against his claim. And then Allah Ta'ala says, he writes that Allah Ta'ala told me that I am Hazrat, uh, Hazrat Musa, and then Hazrat Yus Yunus, and then Hazrat Ibrahim. And then he also says that Allah Ta'ala told me that I am Hazrat Muhammad وسلم, and no one said anything. But when, when Allah Ta'ala told me that I am Hazrat Isa, then like everyone just went against him and uh, started putting uh, allegations of kufr against him and calling him la names and being rude against him and just... Okay. Exactly. Yes, please. <coughs> As alaykum. Coming back to your earlier um, answer where you said Jesus did not die on the cross. If Jesus did not die on the cross, what happened to him or where did he go? Okay, right, so the question that's been raised is that if we believe that Hazrat Isa, alayhi salatu wasalam, Jesus, son of Mary, did not in fact die on the cross, then obviously the question that arises is, okay, well he hasn't died on the cross, then where did he go? Um, Ayaz, sir, could you please talk about this? With regards to the journey of Jesus Islam, after his being saved from the cross, the Ahmadiyya Muslim stance on this issue, which the Promised Messiah Islam presented, and not just the Promised Messiah Islam, the Promised Messiah Islam has said that other research scholars have also hinted towards this as well. But I have researched all of these separate facts and compiled them into one concise book. If anybody wishes to read up upon this, they should read the Promised Messiah Islam's book, Jesus in India. As far as what we believe, we believe that when Jesus Islam, was saved from the cross, we believe that no prophet can go without fulfilling his mission. And if we see realistically in Palestine where Jesus Islam, came, there was only two of the 12 tribes of the house of Israel who, the, who Jesus Islam, was to preach to. Those two tribes, for the most part, did not believe in him. So the promised Messiah, so the promised Messiah Islam says that Jesus Islam, had to fulfill his mission. And in order to do this, he traveled to those 10 tribes of the Bani Israel, which had not yet believed in him. And the, Jesus Islam, said that when I go to them and convey my message to them, they shall believe in me. And through historical reference, we can prove, and other scholars have also written this, that those 10 tribes resided around the area of Afghanistan, Kashmir, India, these places. So Jesus Islam, made his route that way, that way and he fulfilled his mission and after successfully completing his mission and conveying his message to the 12 tribes of the house of Israel, then he died a natural death at the age of 120 which is also stated by the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in a hadith of Ganzul Ummal that, the, that Jesus Islam, lived until the age of 120. So in fact, we can actually see that anyone who says that Jesus died upon the cross, when we see that the fact that the only two of the, uh, of the families of the tribes of Israel were present in the area where um, Hazrat Isa resided, then we can actually see that him dying there would be a failing of his mission. And if we respect Hazrat Isa and Jesus والسلام, to that extent of a prophet of God, how can we say that Jesus died without fulfilling his, his purpose, his purpose as a messenger, his purpose for existing. Without completing his message, it's impossible. Because if he failed to complete his message, then surely this would be an allegation, not just on Jesus, but on God as well. Why did God send a prophet with a message, yet not enable him to complete it? Um, yes, please, can we have more questions? Um, yes, please, in the back. Um, my question is, um, that the Prophet وسلم, he was a universal prophet, right? And uh, he came for the whole world. And uh, we believe in La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And we say that there's, um, we do pray and uh, follow Islam as the Prophet وسلم, um, um, thought it to us. So uh, after we say La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, why do all these Muslim scholars still give fatwas on us as um, that we are kafir. We do try to create peace. We do say love for all, hate for none. But after all, still they say um, these Ahmadis or Qadianis are kafir. Okay, well, this is, a, this is a very basic question, one which is often talked about in not only family discussions, but absolutely everywhere. That when somebody is saying 
one thing that I am a Muslim and la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, then who has the right, who has that authority stamp to put that stamp on that person's heart and say, well, you are not a believer. I mean, this, this is a question which we've, we've discussed already in this program. And the simple answer is that they can't. The simple answer to this entire enigma is that you can't. At no point, with absolutely no stamp of authority, can you go to someone and say, no, you say la ilaha illa Muhammad Rasulullah, but you're not a Muslim. They have no sense of authority, no stamp, Absolutely nothing. They have no means and no background upon which they can give that allegation of disbelief. Another very important topic which has come about in the day-to-day -day life and in discussions all around the world is that of janazah, i.e. the funeral prayer. I mean, in this program today, we've discussed why it is not allowed for a, an Ahmadi individual to read namaz behind a non-Ahmadi imam. And the question that arises a lot of the time is why is it that an Ahmadi does not read the funeral prayer of a non-Ahmadi? Um, Ghassan Saab, could you please? <clears throat> uh, this is a very important question that has been raised a lot uh, in the past on uh, our programs on MTA. And um, I think uh, initially the basic and um, most foremost answer to this is that Janazah is a prayer and namaz. So obviously, as Qudus Sahib has already answered the question, we won't read behind someone who has um, denied or for that matter not accepted or not um, uh, recognized the promised Messiah والسلام, who was prophesied by the Holy Prophet One allegation which we completely shun is that we don't, uh, we don't read namaz behind, uh, we don't read the uh, funeral prayer of a non-Ahmadi. We do, re we do read it at times, there are certain circumstances. Um, now, as far as uh, namaz janazah is concerned, the funeral prayer is concerned, it's what we call in fiqh Ahmadiyya, uh, in fiqh as a whole, uh, farz e kafaya. That is, that if one person from the whole ummah reads that funeral prayer, then he is representing the entire ummah. And where um, someone uh, is, uh, where a non ahmadi even if he's non ahmadi where a Muslim uh, has passed away and there is no one to read his funeral, then Ahmadis will present themselves and say, okay, we will uh, read the funeral prayer of this uh, person and we will be uh, the re responsible for his funeral. There is an interesting incident in the time of the Hazrat Khalifa al Masih Salis, Hazrat Mirza Nasir Ahmad, that once a non ahmadi he passed away and there was no one to read the funeral prayer uh, for him. And Hazrat Khalifa al-Masih Salis, the third successor, instructed the Jamaat in Denmark that you should uh, lead the funeral prayer for that person because no person who is Kalimago, who reads La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah and believes in that, no Muslim should be buried, buried without a Muslim funeral, uh, without an Islamic funeral. I think that's, um, uh, that should cover this. I mean, so yeah, so as we've just explained, the fact that in, juris in, in jurisprudic matters, a funeral service or a funeral prayer is what we call a farzik of fire. I.e. if one person does it, then he represents the whole of the ummah. So if the non-Ahmadis are first al um, alleging against us that why do you not pray behind us, they're also saying don't pray behind us. And then when we say, when we're standing there and there is a funeral procession happening, that this is the same case as us not doing namaz behind them, not praying behind them, because of the fact that they've rejected the coming of the promised Messiah alayhi salatu so we stand there and we see that people are leading the funeral prayers and those people are representing us in fact, they are representing the whole ummah. So therefore there is no dire need for us to step in and actually pray that funeral service behind them. But however, the fact always remains that if there is a Muslim that has died and there is no one to lead him, there is no one to lead the funeral service for him, then it is almost compulsory upon an Ahmadi under the, under the direction of um, the Khalifa of Waqt, under the present Caliph, to actually perform that funeral prayer for him. Because it, as, it, as Ghassan Saab just said, that no Muslim should die and be buried without the funeral prayer being prayed upon him. So this, 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 should, this, answer, your, this answer your question? Well, we've come to the end of the program now, um, but I want to reiterate the fact that we need your input for this program to be successful. Now, alhamdulillah, for the past couple of programs, we've had a very good feedback. But what we want, again, is for you to send all those questions and queries for us in this studio. As many as you like, all those questions that have been, um, that have been slumbering in your mind, questions that you haven't had 
an appropriate answer to, questions that you haven't had answered, questions that you just haven't had the time to ask, we need you to send those questions in because this is what this program is here for. This program is to bring the minds of everyone together so we can move forward to understand the basics and fundamentals of what we believe in and why we believe in it. And to do that, as I've said before, you can send in those questions and queries and comments to our email address at beacon, that's B-E-A-C-O-N, at mta.tv. You can also text them in. The number for the text is 0044 and recently, to, for, your own, for, for your benefit, we've also added a voicemail system into the system, which the, uh, the number to call for that, so which you can leave your messages and uh, questions on, is 0044-2086-878032. Also, you can view the, uh, the programs which have been um, shown here at MTA and the Beacon of Truth. Um, on our website on YouTube, which is www.youtube.com forward slash MTA online one. That's www.youtube.com forward slash MTA online one. Um, I'd like to thank our studio audience here and my panel. Um, and most of all, I'd like to thank the audience at home. Jazakum alasana jaza. And inshallah, we will meet again next time. جزاكم الله أحسن الجزاء السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته اللهم لبيك لبيك